All right. Uh, it's going to be topic today. And, um, uh, my career. Um, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. Now just for locally Obamacare. Um, the name's actually stuck. I didn't think it's stuck even a decade. And while I was, uh, after graduate law school, I was clerking for a judge. And I did something which you should not do, and I started a blog. A blog that, that I found um, uh, worthwhile. This bill is sort of trucking along, coming along. Um, and I was writing about it. And specifically one legal question. The question was this. Um, did Congress have to enact a health insurance? So, um, laugh at this argument. They said, um, of course, Congress can enact this purchase mandate. Um, they said healthcare is a multi-billion dollar industry, and a person who not to buy health insurance has an effect on that industry. All those people who are uninsured, that uninsured rate has a substantial effect on economic activity, I'm sorry, in interstate commerce. They also argue that uh, the healthcare system was a comprehensive scheme, and in order to make this scheme work, you need to have this mandate. And even if this mandate was local, if we got rid of that mandate, it would undercut the entire scheme. So they looked to Lopez, they looked to Morrison, they looked to Rage, they looked to Wicker. And one of the few people who was willing to, um, or who, not willing to the wrong word, but he was one of the few. Now, my role in this was somewhat in the backdrop. It's sort of strange. Um, in November of 2000 and um, late at night, whatever I want. And uh, I came across uh, some friends and they were talking about this new healthcare law. And they were saying, you know, we, we need to think of some constitutional argument. And one of the laws, I don't think I should, I'm working for a judge. And uh, Barnett walked by and uh, the lawyer goes to Randy, you know, Randy, you should really think about writing something with us about the mandate. And the Randy says, and of course, it's in my book, is he hasn't much thought yet. He hadn't, and he was being honest. Uh, but that meeting, which I dubbed the Mayflower Conference, uh, Mayflower Obamacare case, um, and that was November of 2000. Um, during those two and a half years, I was actually clerking for the entirety of that period. Uh, so I was. Larger the side, I didn't file any brief. I thought that the case. I think I have enough for one of the now. So I want to you know, hit, hit the iron while it's hot. And in one of the versions, the Supreme Court with Justice Kennedy, the majority. And in the second version, Chief Justice Kennedy dissent, the court voted to strike down Obamacare. So I was like hedging my bets, right? Like, okay, either mean Kennedy one way or Kennedy the other. So I wrote basically two different endings. Eventually, I was able to rewrite. And um, there were cases involving the mandate. There were cases involving uh, the contraceptive mandate, both Hobby Lobby and the decisions before. Uh, there were cases involving the enforcement of the payments of, uh, of penalties. And there's probably another case that's tricking up now where Texas has indeed challenged the Obamacare mandate once again. In that case, we argued in New Orleans uh, next month. Uh, the reason why I'm canceling class one day in July is because I'm going to go down to New Orleans for a day. So I'll, I'll report back in, in due time. Uh, but this is a law that keeps on giving sort of constitutional law professors. Um, it's also a case that most people don't actually understand. And I hope after this class you will um, get it. Um, so this will be a different class. Uh, I will not be asking as many questions. I will eventually. Uh, but I'll be doing a little more lecturing. This is my standard. Uh, Obamacare talk. I must have given this over a hundred times. Now I only give it once or twice a year because the case is kind of old, but 
when I first book came out, I, I was barnstorming into this cross party a couple times a week. So I mostly commit to memory. We'll see if I still remember it okay. Yes. Oh, it's a public hearing. Okay. Yeah, of course I'll tell you. Yeah, there's no secret. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a hearing for the Fifth Circuit, and the lawyers are arguing the case. I mean, and if you even want, the court uh, posts an audio file. You can listen to it online. So, there, you know, there's nothing secret, nothing private. Uh, I, I want to make sure I'm not wrong. Uh, everything, uh, court hearings, fortunately, are, are in the open. Um, not all courts post audio, which is frustrating. Um, some courts post video. Some courts post audio. Some courts live stream, which I very much like. Uh, this court does not live stream. I think they don't know what I said. It, it's helpful, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a pain in the neck because you have to basically slice it up and chop it up and blah blah. But it, but we got we got it pretty. I think we got it pretty pretty tight. Yeah. All right. So let's start. And in any event, the title of the book was unprecedented. Uh, I don't have to recommend you buy a copy. I gave you a free chapter. You're welcome. Uh, but if you want to buy it, I wouldn't object. It, it's cheap now. It's like four dollars on Amazon. It's like so pathetically cheap. Uh, the the uh, the price keeps dropping and dropping. Uh, yeah. It, 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 it's even Check check the price. It, it was really cheap the last time I checked. I think that's been broken. Um, but uh, it's, I, I don't make any money. The royalties are so trivial. It's basically you don't you don't write books for money uh, unless like you're Harry Potter. Books books don't actually make money. Yeah. I wanted to document the story for history because I knew at some point memories fade. People forget things. And this is a helpful way to um, compress a very important historical um, s event into a single volume. And I'll be writing a third book about Obamacare at some point, maybe next year. But while well, well, it's still fresh in my in my Mueller report, right? Okay. Uh, so the Affordable Care Act um, was the signature achievement of President Obama, and was really the defining. Uh, legislation that he was able to enact during his first two years in office. Um, but the ACA had uh, all the trappings of a huge constitutional case with a clash between the presidency, uh, the Congress, the U.S. Supreme Court over the meaning of the Constitution. And this issue did not arise in a boring context, like the gun-free schools went out, which is a law that no one actually cared about. It arose in a very important and sensitive area in American policy, which is healthcare. Um, healthcare is expensive. And for the last decades, there have been nonstop efforts by the government to try to reform or improve or change American health care policy. Now, I show students this picture. Uh, I don't think you were born yet. No, no. I don't know what this picture is even of. Yeah, very good. Pet project, I like that. Right, so this was a uh, long, long time ago in 1993, yeah, 93, uh, where First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton uh, was tasked by her husband, the president, with leading a task force. And this task force was supposed to come with, up with a, a, a reform package to change American health care law. The idea was they called the so-called Health Security Act, HSA, where everyone gets these little health care cards. Uh, employers would, would be required to provide insurance, and it would expand government insurance, and there was this, this huge proposal. Um, as you probably know, it didn't succeed. It did not succeed. Um, why? At the time, there was a very successful TV ad campaign. Yes, before computers and things, people watched commercials. They couldn't fast forward them. It wasn't possible. Um, this commercial was very significant. It depicted a Midwestern couple, Harry and Louise, and they were sitting around the kitchen table reading, there was no PBS, this huge book, this 
the, the proposal that Hillary Clinton's uh, uh, team had put forward. And the message of these commercials was actually fairly straightforward. Um, we don't want government getting to us and our doctors, right? We don't want government interference with our health care. You might say we like our doctor, we want to keep our doctor, right? Um, these commercials were paid for by the insurance lobby, right? There's no, there's no doubt who was paying for them, but they were very effective. And in a fairly short span, the popularity of the healthcare proposal plummeted. And as a result, the next 20 odd years, um, nothing really changed. That is until uh, President Obama was sworn into office. Um, in 2008, he won the presidential election and his party, the Democratic Party, had a majority in the House by a lot of votes. And indeed, after all the votes were counted and all the uh, elections were resolved, there were 60 votes in the Senate. And the key benefit of a 60 vote block is you don't have to worry about what's called the filibuster, right? You don't need the minority party to buy in. You can pass whatever legislation you want. So long as every member of the Democratic caucus stays in line, they would not need a single Republican vote to pass major legislation. Uh, this is actually Chief Justice Roberts of Baltimore County here the last 10 years. Uh, I, I track you. Um, uh, this was Chief Justice Roberts giving the oath to President Obama the first time. And here's the second time. You may remember this, but on the first day of the inauguration in 2009, they screwed up the oath. They both did. It was both their faults. Um, the problem is they're both really smart, right? And they both committed the oath to memory instead of reading the damn card. And on the card that Roberts had, you break at different points. And the card that Obama had, you break at different points. So they're talking over each other. And there was actually a, a mini crisis. Is the constitutional oath valid if they don't recite it correctly? So the next day they went to the White House and they recited the oath again a second time. Yes. I was so impressed with how a true constitutional scholar talked to somebody about it and they had it right. Well, I, would, I wouldn't call either of them a constitutional scholar. Uh, I mean, oh, <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. Uh, <laughs> I think they're both the savvy politicians um, in, in different offices, although one of them's still an officer, one's not. Uh, actually, well, there's one savvy politician. He's out of office. The other politician's not so savvy. I'll tell you next time. Um, but anyway, they redid the oath. And in fact, um, in 2013, when President Obama was reelected, they did the oath twice again. Why? Well, the inauguration day fell on a Sunday. And you can't have an inauguration on Sunday. So they did the actual oath on a Sunday. They basically had a fake oath on the next day on Monday. He's already president. So, you know. President Obama and Franklin Roosevelt shared the honor of taking the oath four times, although only two terms. And uh, the president made one of his primary uh, missions to achieve health care reform. And that was done through a bill known as the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. Um, now, Early on, the Republicans recognized they did not have the votes to stop this thing. Um, they didn't. So long as the Democratic caucus held together, they were going to pass whatever they wanted to pass. Right? That was a simple fact. Um, around the same time, though, people started raising not policy objections to the law, but constitutional objections to the law. And I want to just pause on this point for a moment. There's a difference between arguing that's a bad policy versus that's unconstitutional, right? Congress can enact all the bad policies it wants, right? You can't stop a law because it's a stupid idea. You can stop a law if it's unconstitutional by going to the courts. Uh, so in any common discourse, whenever you hear, this president violated the Constitution, what they're actually saying is, we can't stop this through democratic process. We're going to go to the courts. Right? That's the th that's the tr that's the plan. Now, I, I don't think this is cynical. I do think lots of laws are both bad or unconstitutional. Lots of laws are good. For, I'll give you an example. Justice Scalia used to have a stamp, a red stamp that would say "stupid but constitutional." It wasn't a real. He didn't actually use it, but it, it gave the idea that this law is dumb, but Congress has the power to enact it. So I think it describes most laws. And where did this constitutional movement 
developed in large part based on a group that uh, we don't hear much about anymore. We don't, uh, which is the, the Tea Party. Now, in, in truth, the Tea Party actually began before Barack Obama was elected. It began during the Bush presidency, um, where people were upset at the bailout and these other various um, assertions of federal power over the economy. But the Tea Party really gained some steam during the Obama presidency. And part of their, 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 their mission was not just saying that the president was engaging in a terrible policy, uh, but was also grounded in the Constitution. And they argued vigorously that the mandate to purchase insurance was unconstitutional. Um, they started to grow in size and they had rallies and hearings across the country and they marched on Washington. And indeed on the weekend that Obamacare passed the house in March of 2010, they had this huge rally outside the Capitol. Um, I know cause I was there. Now I wasn't actually attending it. Um, I was actually in DC for a conference and it was totally around. I was like, you know, let me go check this out. So I went there. Um, it was, it was, as a, as a, again, I was still a law clerk, but as a constitutional law nerd, it was bizarre, right? Let me tell you why. They weren't just saying that Obamacare is bad policy. They were like actually articulating with some sophistication constitutional arguments. I saw one guy, I wish I took a picture of it. He had a sign that said, overturn Rickard v. Hilder. A guy who I'm certain was not a lawyer, right? Some guy with a sign in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. The sign says, overturn Rickard v. Hilder. Now, did any of you know what Rickard was before two weeks ago? Of course not. I didn't. And I was like, oh, my God, that's so cool. Right? That's amazing. I was like, that's that's perfect. I also saw John Boyd. This is before you went full John Boyd. Uh, but he was there, and he was doing his thing. And uh, yeah, it was just it, it was an, an intense experience. Um, also, fun fact, but while I was there, I decided to randomly take a tour of the Capitol Visitor Center. Um, I was just walking around. And then at one point, I said, you have to leave. I'm like, why? I'm like, the, you have to go now. I'm like, what the hell's going on? I found out later that the room that I was in, the president was coming for. He was giving like a rally of his troop speech to the senators, uh, so the members of the House who were voting. So basically, I got kicked out for the Obama keep his pep, pep rally. Uh, so like I just had this this bizarre knack of being in the wrong place at the right time, being in the right place at the wrong time, and it, it seems to always be there, which is why you never go to the con con panels. Like stay in the hallway. Always wander around. You can see at least online you can be in line. Um, but anyway, this political movement, which had to take a very strong constitutional flavor, uh, would not succeed in stopping the law in Congress. And there's a simple reason why. The Democrats had the votes. They had their votes. They had a supermajority in the Senate, 60 votes. I think they had like a 30 or 40 seat majority in the House. Um, so the Republicans recognized pretty early on that they were not going to be able to stop this one through votes. And this was uh, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid of Nevada. The actual ACA bill that we have now, with some modifications, was introduced in December of 2009. December of 2009. There were lots of other versions, but the actual bill that was voted on was first introduced in December of 2009. Um, this is the bill printed out, stacked up high. Um, now, they had only a fairly short time to read it, uh, to, to, to vote on it. Do you think any of the members of Congress actually read the bill they voted on? Of course not. In fact, Senator Max Baucus of Montana, who was one of the, uh, he was the chair of the finance, which is a very influential committee. Uh, once told people, uh, how do you phrase it? I pay staffers to read bills for me, so I don't have to read them, right? So no one actually read the damn bill, and that becomes significant later, which I'll explain why, right? Um, they had a vote on December 24th of 2009, Christmas Eve, and the idea was let the Senate versions before they go for Christmas break. Then when you vote on it, they'll send it to the House. The House will make all these changes, right, and make the bill a lot better because the House was really leading the show. Then the House would vote, send it back to the Senate. The Senate would vote on the revised bill, 
which the president could then sign. That was the plan. So fine. Okay. So on December 24th, 2009, 60 Democratic senators voted to approve the ACA. It was, it was basically a draft bill. It was never meant to be final, right? So 60 senators voted on this bill. Okay. The deal was after Christmas, it goes to the House. That plan would soon become undone. Why? The previous summer, Senator Ted Kennedy, a Democrat from Massachusetts, the brother of President Kennedy, he had died. The governor of Massachusetts appointed a temporary senator. His name doesn't even matter. It's ridiculous. Patrick Kennedy. His job was just there to cast votes for a few months, right? And he was one of the 60 who approved the ACA uh, in December. In January of 2009, Massachusetts held a special election. Now, I don't expect to know much about politics, but as a general matter, Massachusetts is a fairly reliable Democratic state. It is. It's a fairly easy blue state. Yet, a Republican won the special election, a guy named Scott Brown, who's actually now the ambassador to New Zealand. He's still floating around. Um, Scott Brown, a Republican, won the special election in January of 2010. Now, that wasn't particularly significant, except for one point. It reduced the Democrats' lead from a 60-vote majority to a 59-vote majority. And with the 59-vote majority, the Republicans can now filibuster the president. This almost derailed the entire health care reform. Right? Had that election been held a few weeks earlier, we would not have Obamacare, right? It, it, it's there are so many points where we could have just never had this entire law wouldn't exist. If if a couple hundred votes went the other way in Minnesota, Al Franken lost. We would not have Obamacare, right? There were so many close things that happened that this law that it even exists is is is, is I would use the word miracle, but it's, it's a fluke. That's just true. That so many things have to come together at the right time. Okay, so now what happened? The House was stuck. They were planning to make all these changes to the bill and make it much better. But they couldn't. Because if they made any changes to the bill and that revised bill sent back to the Senate, the Republicans would filibuster it. So they couldn't make the changes they wanted to make. As a result, they said, you know what? We'll vote on the bill as it is. So basically, the Obamacare law we have now was a draft. Right, imagine turning like your first legal writing memo, the first draft versus the final version. That's your healthcare system, right? We are we are living with a draft bill. May I never let people forget that. Uh, it was a draft. It wasn't meant to be final. A lot of the things we have were never designed to be real. They made certain small changes involving budgetary matters, um, and the key aspect of a budgetary change is it doesn't get subject to the filibuster. There were some changes made involving budgetary issues, which were not filibuster. Basically, the entire law is structure, everything else, you're stuck. Speaker Pelosi was able to navigate the bill through the various committees and get her troops in line. And Speaker John Boehner uh, is actually now a lobbyist for marijuana. He's, he's got new heights, or uh, maybe he just got high, I don't know. But he, he's, uh, he's making a lot of money now by lobbying for legalizing marijuana. It's a new post Congress gig. Uh, but the Republicans realized that they could not stop this bill. Okay. Um, comes to a floor vote. March 3rd of 2010. I might be off by a day or so. That was the day that I was visiting uh, D.C. And take a look at this vote, sir. There were 219 Democrats who voted yay. 34 Democrats voted no. 176 Republicans voted no. And zero, zero Republicans voted yay. The bet, bill passed by the most narrow of margin, right? That this most fundamental law that changed a huge portion of our economy passed on a straight party line vote in the House. Now, you can look at this in two different ways, I think, right? One is uh, the Republicans are being uh, intransigent, they were not being cooperative, and it was their fault they should have fallen in line with the actual bill and compromised more. Um, the other way to look at it is 
in American history, when big laws pass, they always receive a bipartisan support. Uh, Social Security, uh, Civil Rights Act, the Americans with Disabilities, go down the list. This bill was due from the beginning. And only now, a decade later, has the ACA cracked above 50% popularity. It happened fairly recently, largely because of President Trump's fault. Uh, but for so long, this, this law was partisan. I think as a, if I can do a policy point for a moment, healthcare law should not be such a partisan issue, but now any change in healthcare law is tinged by this sort of partisan divide that ancient world people no one expected. Uh, but this was the vote. It passed the House, went back to the President, he signed. And this is a photo of, uh, it's a fairly famous photo, you've probably seen it, of President Obama signing the bill. Uh, he must be thinking, yes, I won, you know, wherever it was, not twice. Uh, one fun fact, he's also the pen brother here. They actually sign the um, signature with like 20 different pens, right? So each pen's like one stroke, one stroke, one stroke. And they hand out these pens as mementos, right? As tokens of appreciation. So like, I have the pen that signed Obamacare. Oh, he's one of like 20, 25 pens. So I think it's still a, a nice gesture. Uh, there's Biden. No, no. Um, there, is, there is a picture with it. I know. <laughs> I have a shelter. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm looking at. Uh, it's like nothing ever changes. I've been doing the same crap for decades. I'm still talking about Obamacare and Biden. I swear. My, my, my life is like this endless loop of Obamacare. I just keep losing. So there's that Biden money. Who is putting Um, not constitutional crises, but several of the implementation problems, I think, result directly from the fact that it was a draft bill. Uh, so, for example, there was a case aside in 2014 or 15, no, 2015 called King v. Burwell. It was not a constitutional case, but it had to do with some of the language in the statute. And it, the statute, as written, I think, uh, 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 would have limited uh, which states can receive certain subsidies. Um, I won't go into the language of the case, it's complicated for this right now, but the way I read the language is only certain states can get these subsidies. And the Obama administration issued a rule saying all states get these subsidies, right? So this case went to the Supreme Court and John Roberts did his thing and said, no, nah, it's okay, Obamacare, we'll, we'll live another day. But a lot of the implementation problems derive directly from the fact that the law was passed in a draft form. One other aspect, in 2017, the House Republicans zeroed out the penalty, right? They reduced the penalty to zero dollars. The fact that Obamacare was passed in this sort of manner in 2010 allowed the Republicans in 2017 to kill the penalty. So, so much of the current Obamacare debate flows directly from how the law was enacted. That, that's an uncontradictory point. Anyway, I can't see Biden pointing to the driver. Okay. Uh, at this point, Press Obama was happy. He's, you know, I have my legacy secured. Not so fast. Within minutes, I think it was like 20 minutes after the president signed the bill, lawsuits were filed across the country, right? The attorney general of Virginia filed one lawsuit. The attorney general of Florida filed another. And there were suits filed across the country. And they all made the same argument. They argued that the Affordable Care Act was unconstitutional and that Congress lacked the power to compel people to purchase health insurance. Anyone think? Of course, the leading precedent we have is our favorite farmer, Roscoe Kilburn, and his antagonist, the New Dealer, Claude Wicker. Evil name Wicker. It sounds like a like a name of a villain, like John Wick, right? It's, it's a bad name. Um, we know that Wicker largely expanded the scope of the commerce and medicine property clause. By the way, this is a political cartoon. I, I know you can't read the caption that says the commerce clause, right? It was amazing, and I, I don't mean this as a as like a suck up, but. People who generally don't make constitutional arguments are making constitutional arguments. I, I, that, that makes me happy as a left press writer. It's very good news now to start debating constitutional things. Uh, uh, 
Now, now it's actually people on the left who are making constitutional arguments. It seems to fluctuate depending on power. Uh, right there. Um, what other presses? We have Angel Rach, right? And Gonzales v. Rach, uh, which my good friend and confidant, uh, Randy, I did him some years ago. We, we all get older. I, I know I'm making these videos and I look nice and young, but in 20 years I'll look a lot older than that. Uh, but it, you know, that's, that's, that's how life goes. We're elected and stone. And the defining image of the Obamacare litigation uh, became a vegetable. Awkward. I actually considered briefly putting a piece of broccoli in the front cover of my book. Oh, it was so bad. It was terrible. It was great. But I, I, I made a couple mock-ups, and they looked kind of cute. It was like, basically, it was a thing of broccoli growing out of the Supreme Court's roof. It was a bad idea. But I thought about it for a little bit. And the argument was this. Can the government make you buy broccoli? Now, what the hell does broccoli have to do with health care? Well, follow the argument there, right? If you make people buy broccoli, they might eat it. And if people eat broccoli, they'll be healthier. And if they're healthier, then it will decrease the amount of health insurance they'll need, and it will reduce costs. Is that insane? What about a gym membership, right? If you make people buy a gym membership, maybe they'll go, maybe they won't. But if they go, they'll be healthier. And if they're healthier, they reduce costs. So too with health insurance. If you buy, I'm sorry, if you make people buy health insurance, they might use it, they might not, right? They, they can't make you go to a doctor. If you have it, maybe you'll go. And if you go to a doctor for preventive care, maybe you won't need some bigger procedure down the road, reducing costs. So the arguments were, uh, uh, you know, ridiculed widely. But I mean, this this image made it into pop culture. This is Family Guy. Uh, this is on the episode of The Simpsons, right, where the Obama guy is making his party broccoli. Um, it's just amazing how this this story pervaded pop culture. And now, you know, we're basically a decade away, so it's fading. But uh, I can at least keep it alive for my poor students. So at least one. If there's ever one of you, I'll just do a one day class. I can I can, I can, I can do it. Uh, the other example was uh, General Motors. At the time, General Motors was owned by the United States government. You know, can you make people buy a Chevrolet as a means to improve the Detroit economy? Okay. Uh, oh, here's Obama saying you see the O? It's very visible how they're, they're different like strokes. That's because you use different pens to make the O. So you, you see it, right? And he hands out these tokens. Before the ink even dries on a signature, people will write the court. The first lawsuit was filed by the Attorney General of Virginia, um, a guy named Ken Cuccinelli. He's actually an alum of my law school. Um, in my third year of law school, I actually hosted a debate for the Republican uh, AG race. He was one of the nominees. He won. Uh, and he had very high hopes and ambitions. He, he hoped this case would put him on the map. And he was um, not the first to file. He had some problems with like, kind of filing. Florida was there first. He came in like 20 minutes later. Um, you'll learn this soon when you become a lawyer. Uh, you have to file documents through what's called electronic filing, and it's often very um, unreliable. And never leave a filing to the last minute. So I imagine, like, you know, your your filing deadline is midnight. You say, okay, I filed 11.55. You know, do not do that. I, I know people do this. I, I have a heart attack. I, I can't risk it. Submit all of your crap well in advance. Yeah, pretty much. When your credit card doesn't work, the Comcast shuts down, right? There's so many things that can happen. You ever have a submission for like a legal writing memo and you're like, just write the deadline? Boy, I, I would never. I submit hours in advance. I, I can't. Yeah. But the first lawsuit filed, well, not the first one, the first one to be ruled on was in the Eastern District of Virginia and Richmond. And a federal judge actually found that the mandate was unconstitutional. This was like an oh shit moment. I don't know if it worth to say it. People flipped out, right? Because up to this point, I would say, oh, this Randy Barnett guy, he's a nut shop, he's this fringe libertarian litigator. No one's going to take his arguments seriously. And then you get a federal judge who writes an opinion that declares the mandate unconstitutional. And people flipped out. And I suspect President Obama also was not very happy about it. 
Um, at the time, Obamacare was not popular at, at all. Um, and for one, one funny reason, conservatives hated it because it was Obama's thing, and liberals hated it because it wasn't single payer, right? It, it, no one was actually happy with the law that came out of the process. Basically, everyone was unhappy with it. And that only now, a decade later, I think we're even that, I think. But then the, the second shoe dropped. This is Judge uh, 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 Roger Vincent, um, who's based in Pensacola, Florida, on the Panhandle. And he was uh, hearing the case filed by Florida and uh, about 10 other attorneys general. A funny story, Texas wanted to be in the lead, but Florida filed first, so eventually Texas joined on to Florida's case. Now, why was the case filed in Pensacola? As you know, the capital of Florida is Tallahassee. The reason why the lawyers didn't like the federal judges in Tallahassee, so they shopped for a better forum you know, in Pensacola. Um, I see nothing wrong with this. When you are a lawyer one day and you have to choose where to file your case, you have a duty to find the best forum for your client. If you don't, you are engaging in malpractice. So I see nothing wrong with this. And they picked a forum where they had a better chance of drawing a, a favorable judge, and they did. And Judge Vinson wrote this long opinion, this long opinion, I remember reading it, where he found that the mandate was unconstitutional, but he went a step further. He said that the mandate was so important to the ACA that if the mandate fell, the entire law fell apart. Wow. Without the mandate, without people going into the marketplace to buy insurance, people could free ride. They could just wait till they're sick and buy insurance then and then they can't be charged extra because they're sick. And the judge found that this entire regime is built on the fact that people have to buy insurance when they're healthy. And if we don't have this, Congress got to start from scratch. So he declared the entire ACA's uh, uh, unconstitutional. And I remember when this happened, uh, his name was Roger Vinson. Um, he was a, a law professor uh, at Yale named Akil Amar. Um, who compared Roger Vincent to Roger Pawnee, the author of Dred Scott. Uh, hyperbole of the highest order. Um, you know, they, the, the, the law professor said that it's partisanship that these are Republican evil judges, which is what Vincent is hearing today. So whenever, you know, Trump talks about judges, I just turn everything back to media, the entire Scott family. See, this is why I write stuff down. I actually keep stuff re recorded. Um, because recently, um, Recently, I had to check this because someone asked me about how, you know, oh, I remember. Because in December of 2018, a few months ago, a federal judge in, in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, declared Obamacare unconstitutional. And people were, like, flipping out, calling him the sort of, uh, you know, the, 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 this awful judge. And basically the same stuff they said about Judge Vincent a decade ago. So the same, same crap uh, is what he's on doing. Anyway, President Obama would, could not have been happy with the ACA ruling from Florida. But trial courts are not the end of the road. The case is an appeal to the courts of appeals, and there will be three or actually four significant oral arguments. Um, one in the Sixth Circuit in Ohio, which is where I clerked. I actually cl I started clerking, I think, about a month or two after the case was decided. So I had no involvement. There was another appeal from the Eleventh Circuit based in Atlanta, another appeal from the Fourth Circuit in Richmond, Virginia, and another one in the D.C. Circuit. And at least three of those cases will be argued by these two. Uh, this is uh, Neil Kotkow, who's basically now MSNBC pundit. He's a very good lawyer, and also he's been very, very uh, exposed uh, in the Trump deal. Uh, and this is Paul Clement, who was the Bush Solicitor General, who has become basically the de facto Republican Attorney General uh, for the whole conservative party. Okay. Uh, first, let's talk about the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, in this case, we had a decision which the court upheld the Obamacare law. And in particular, Judge Sutton, who's a friend of mine, he's a very good judge, he was a George W. Bush nominee, um, and he ruled that the Obamacare law should be upheld. And this is considered a sign that, look, even conservative judges can uphold Obamacare. So this is the happy Obama victim because he's very pleased with the law. But the next case turned out very differently. This case was from the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals based in Atlanta, Georgia. This was the appeal from Judge Vincent's ruling in Florida. And here, there was a joint opinion from Judge Frank Hall, and uh, Frank is a female judge, right? 
and Judge Kuzina, and they ruled that the Obamacare mandate was unconstitutional, but they disagreed with the district court. They said that you could sever or separate the mandate from the rest of the law, that you could have the Obamacare law without the mandate. But this was huge because now you have what's known as a dirt split, right? The Sixth Circuit said that Obamacare was constitutional. The Eleventh Circuit said that Obamacare's mandate was unconstitutional. At this point, the Supreme Court had to step in and intervene, right? And President Obama recognized that now the fate of his law would turn on what the Supreme Court was doing. The next court to hear it was the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Richmond. Um, I need to take a, a little bit of a detour and talk about an aspect of the law that's not very well known. The tax. Okay. You may or may not remember that during the 2008 presidential election, President Obama made a pledge of no new taxes, right? Every Democrat from top to bottom said no new taxes. As Obamacare was being debated, the president was asked over and over again, is this a tax? He says, no, it's not. Every Democrat in office asked, does the Obamacare law impose new taxes? They all said, no, it doesn't. No surprise when the law is being drafted and they had to actually discuss the mechanism by which people pay money for going uninsured, they described it as a penalty, right? The law describes the money you have to pay for going uninsured as a penalty. What's the difference between a penalty and a tax? Well, from your pocketbook perspective, it's really no difference, right? If I pay a $5 penalty or a $5 tax, it's $5 out of your wallet. But there is a constitutional difference between the two. A tax is premised on the taxing clause. Right? Whereas a penalty is based on the commerce clause. Right. Remember we did the DeWitt case a couple of days ago where Congress had imposed taxes on the sale of multiple oil. That was fine. But Congress couldn't criminalize the sale of other oil. Right? The tax is fine. Congress can tax local activity. Had Congress, uh, had Congress simply said we're going to tax people to uninsure um, the Obamacare case would be a lot easier, but they didn't. They made a political decision not to call it a tax that was imposed on Congress. Instead, they called it a penalty. Now, it's a penalty you pay to the IRS. It's a penalty that you include on your tax return. It has all the features of a tax, but it didn't call it a tax. In the early days of the litigation, the government was faced with a choice. Do we defend the law as a tax? There's a wrinkle, though. Um, you know, we all, hopefully, all paid your taxes two months ago, right? April? Maybe you didn't. There's a rule in the tax code called the Tax Anti Injunction Act. Or the Anti Injunction Act. You'll learn this when you take tax. Um, it goes like this If you disagree with the tax, you have to pay it first and then sue for a refund. Right? If there's a tax that's assessed against you, you have to pay it first and sue for refund. You cannot simply sue first, say, okay, I'll pay the tax in five years when the litigation's over. Right? If that was possible, no one would ever pay their taxes, they'd be litigating forever. Okay. If the Obamacare penalty is a tax, you could only sue after you pay it and collect your refund. Right? The Obamacare penalty would not be assessed until 2015. No one would actually pay it. But here's the problem. If someone is challenging the tax in 2010, that will not be assessed until 2015. The case is not yet right. You can't bring it yet. So initially, the government argued in court, all these cases are premature, right? Come back in 2015. But here's the problem. President Obama may not have been in office in 2015. And leaving the entirety of the ACA in limbo for those years uh, was considered an unacceptable option for the Supreme Court. They couldn't let the entire thing linger for that long. So what did they do? They basically said, well, 
we're going to defend the mandate of the pact. Right? But they're not. Well, think about this for a minute, right? They want to argue, right? The government wants to argue that you can uphold the penalty under the taxing power. But if they argue that it's a tax, the case is premature. How do they thread this needle? Right? How do they get around this problem? Well, the Fourth Circuit didn't really address that issue, although one judge found that you could uphold the law as a tax. The court that really brought this issue to the fore was the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. And a judge who now everyone knows his name, um, Brett Kavanaugh. He hates when I talk about this name, I'm sure. Um, I, I hate that everyone hates me. Um, Brett Kavanaugh was one of the judges to hear an Obamacare case <clears throat> in 2010. And Judge Kavanaugh um, issued a very uh, strange opinion. He did not say that Congress has the power to back it from the Commerce Clause or the Investment Profit Clause. He had this very bizarre, complicated opinion based on tax code. I frankly still don't understand it. I'm not smart enough. Uh, he's a smart dude for sure, but I'm not smart enough to read it. During the oral argument, he was asking the lawyer for the DOJ about some provision of the tax code. I don't know who the hell it was. And then the other judge said to the lawyer, do you even know what he's talking about? He's like, no, Your Honor, I don't. So Kavanaugh came up with this himself. But he basically came up with this sort of theme in his opinion. Even if the opinion is not a tax, in many regards, it resembles a tax. Right? And that, that idea planted a seed in the mind of this guy, named Ron Gilly. He was the U.S. Solicitor General. He was a top lawyer for the government. And it would be his job to argue the case before the U.S. Supreme Court. All right? And the case would be argued over the course of three days in March of 2010, which was the court that was in existence at the time. Wow. Every time I teach this, more of them are gone. Scalia's gone. Henry's gone. Man, they keep, keep slotting up. Now Ginsburg's seated right next to uh, where Kennedy was. Yeah, so the Thomas is here now. And then they basically they move around in seniority. So the chief is here, so senior's there. Then the then go senior, so first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, they all sit in the seniority for the first year six. And here are pictures of the investiture of Justice Sotomayor in two thousand nine. Justice Ginsburg gave her the she called a jabot. I call it a neck doily. It's, it's too tough. And I swear, if you actually look in Black's Law Dictionary, it'll say neck doily. Brian Garner didn't put it there. That, that, that's my um, book. Uh, but here, they're on the court. They're all looking all happy. Uh, they're all taking pictures. But early on in the Obama presidency, there was some friction with the Supreme Court, um, specifically just Alito. Uh, in January of 2010, the court decided Citizens United versus NBC. Uh, there was a campaign finance case that you can read about in the first amendment. Um, and at one point during President Obama's State of the Union, he said, I'm paraphrasing, the Supreme Court overruled 100 years of precedent. Right? They overruled 100 years of Supreme Court precedent, which wasn't true. Um, and how do you know it's not true? Uh, Justice Alito told us. He actually was on camera mouthing not true. Um, he never came back after this. Uh, he hasn't made the mistake he didn't want, which is a good idea. By the way, fun, fun fact, uh, Justice Ginsburg has never been to the Republican State of the Union. Uh, she went to every year of the Obama presidency, but not once with George W. Bush or President Trump. I think that's, you know, I'd rather she just never go and go with the president she likes. Anyway, we already knew that President Obama was not willing to criticize the justices to their faces. He, he was seeing very close to them. Um, the case was going to be argued over the course of three days in March. Now, you may not know, who was the Supreme Court? Have you been? Yeah, you were in D.C., right? Um, the Supreme Court, as you know, has no cameras, right? Uh, 
they're not cameras. The only way to get in is to get a ticket. Now, if you're friends with a justice or friends with a member of the court, you might be able to get a reserve seat. Um, but for most people, poor schlubs like us, right? Not anymore. Now, 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 now I can get in. Uh, I, I remember the bar so you can sneak in. Not sneak in, but there's a special section for their lawyers that so you can get into the hell house. That's so long ago. Um, but for most people to get in, they have to wait outside. And they have to camp. And in this case, people camped outside the street of Houston for 72 hours. They were actually living on the sidewalk. I mean, with tents and actually, no, you can't have a tent in a tarp, right? It's basically, you can have a tarp unless you, I guess, pitch it, in which case you have the tent and you can't have that. Um, when I was in, uh, when I was clerking, uh, I waited outside for, I think, two or three different cases. I waited about 12 hours. Let me tell you, that sucks. I, I, camping on the sidewalk is not fun. Uh, there are no bathrooms nearby. It's like a 20 minute walk to the next bathroom. You have to go to Union Station, which is a huge train station not too far away. Um, and I'll give you another pro tip. Um, the Supreme Court has a very nice lawn. The reason why it's so nice is that sprinklers that come on at 3 in the morning, which wakes you up. So it's a fun wake up call. So it sucks, right? And they basically give you one of these little yellow tickets with number on it. And the first 50 people to get a ticket uh, have entry to the court to hear the case. Uh, another part that sucks is people cut the line. Uh, one night I was there and I, I counted, I was number 41 or 42. And by the time it came to sunrise, I was like number 48 or 49. People were like cutting the line. And the, the Supreme Court police, they don't, they don't police it at all. Um, the other part that sucks is you have paid line waiting. Um, this part's actually quite sad. You have these companies that basically hire homeless people to sit on the line all day, and they're paid like nothing. And they resell their ticket for thousands of dollars. I'm, I'm not kidding, thousands of dollars you pay to have someone sit on the line for you to, to, get, to get a seat. Um, lawyers used to actually pay people to go on the, on the lawyer line. And the Supreme Court said, no, 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 for the lawyer line, you can't be, you have to be a lawyer, right? You can't hire a student. Um, when you are now lawyers, after three years after you're admitted to the Texas bar, or whatever bar you take, you can apply to the Supreme Court bar. I'd be happy to be your sponsor. I'd be happy to do it, right? Um, you need two sponsors. And if you go to D.C. and you schedule a date in advance, your lawyer can actually move for your admission in open court. So you can be sworn in by the Chief Justice in open court. It's very cool. Yeah, really. I, and, and I think every year, every other year, the South Texas Alumni Society does a thing in D.C. where they'll bring you in. I was Professor Field's sponsor for him. And were, I didn't swear him in, but I, I signed his name. He needed to. Um, I was actually sworn in the day that the Nicholson Hyde Park would be argued by the Lincoln seat sitting in front of us. It's very cool. But anyway, the case we argued in March of 2012, basically two years to the day um, after the ACA was enacted. There were going to be three days of oral argument. Right? Usually cases are argued in a span of one hour. Here the court divided up into almost six hours of argument time. This was such a significant case. How are they ordered? What were they thinking? Were they in alphabetical order? The order makes absolutely no sense. I've been teaching this slide for a decade. This order makes no sense. They're in alphabetical order. Why would they think they were thinking in alphabetical order? Oh, that's wrong. Is that what they did? No, that's wrong. I, I reject this slide. Okay. I can't even look at it. You, you know the reason why is in all of your videos, right, when you see the justices lined up, they're all lined up in the correct seniority. And it's so annoying to get them in the right order, which is why they make no sense. But anyway, I'll use this slide. This slide's prettier. Um, there's going to be four day, uh, sorry, three days of argument and four different arguments. Day number one concerned the Tax Anti-Injunction Act, right? Um, can the court even hear this now? Is there jurisdiction? If this is a tax that won't be assessed until 2015, that's only 2012 now, can we even hear it? Day number two concerned the mandate. Did Congress have the power to enact the individual mandate? Day number three in the morning was what, uh, what's known as severability. That is, if the mandate is unconstitutional, does the rest of the law then fall? Um, think of severability the way you think of amputation, right? It's a gross metaphor, but it actually works, right? 
So imagine that you have a, a toe that gets infected, right? Um, it might be enough to just chop off the toe and your foot's fine. Maybe you have to chop off a couple toes. Maybe you have to chop off the entire foot to save the patient, right? Maybe you have to chop off below the knee. Maybe you have to amputate the entire leg. Maybe the patient's gonna die if the infection's too strong, right? Think of severability the same way. If part of a statute is unconstitutional, is infected, how much do you have to cut off to save the rest of it, right? So maybe just cut the mandate off is fine. Or maybe cut off the mandate plus the parts of the law that require you to treat people with these conditions. Or maybe the entire patient has to be killed and start from scratch, right? That's the question of severability. And that was the issue for the morning argument on day number three. On the afternoon of day number three was a topic that's not even mentioned yet. It was in your reading, which is the Medicaid exam. Um, Medicaid is a health insurance program for people uh, with low income and with certain types of disabilities. Um, it's a partnership between the federal government and the state government. That is, the federal government gives the states a boatload of money to um, manage this program, and then the states have to comply with certain requirements of how this care is provided. Okay. Under the ACA, the government and every state would have to then cover people who are at 132% of the poverty line, right? So before, if you were at the poverty line, you'd get it. The Medicaid expansion raised the level of people who are above the poverty line. Florida and the other states complained about it. Expansion. They argued that it was unconstitutional. Now, what case could they have possibly relied on? Dole, right? South Dakota v. Dole. They argued that the, man, I'm sorry, the Medicaid expansion ran afoul of the fifth condition that Chief Justice Rehnquist identified. The fifth condition was it was coercive. Right? And let me explain why it was coercive. Many states started to join Medicaid in the 1960s, 70s. And they expected this money with certain conditions, right? That they would take money and they would spend it in a certain way. But now the condition was changed. And the condition was like this. If you do not expand Medicaid to cover all these new people, you will lose all of your funding. All of it. Not just the new money that Obamacare provided. You would lose everything. There's this one letter from the state of Arizona that was in the record where the government told Arizona, if you fail to expand Medicaid, we'll basically bankrupt you, right? We'll take away like, I forget the numbers, like in the billions of dollars, it will bankrupt the state of Arizona, okay? And so they argue it's coercive. Now, no court had ever found that a spending program was coercive. That is, it was not a proper exercise of federal power. No court ever found that. But Florida argued that it was. Okay, so everyone get the idea? Day one is the Tax Anti Injunction Act. Day two is the mandate. Day three in the morning was severability. And day three in the afternoon was the Medicaid expansion. Everyone with me? Okay, let's go one at a time. Um, day one was the most important argument that no one cared about, right? Who the hell cares about the Tax Anti Injunction Act? Give me the Commerce Clause, right? Give me Wicked Be Pilgrim. Give me something I can bite my teeth into, right? Who cares about the tax law? Regrettably, it's the most important argument of the day that no one wants. Here, the arguments were made by Don Early, the U.S. Solicitor General, and Paul Clement, who was the, uh, uh, the lawyer for the uh, Florida Attorney General. Okay? Don really had a tough argument to make. By the way, whoever draws Kagan, I don't know what, what they think they are or something, they just make it look so bad in these pictures. I, I, it always troubles me. Um, but Don really had a tough argument. He had to argue two different things. On day number one, he had to argue that the mandate, I'm sorry, what is that? On day number one, he had to argue that the penalty was not a tax. Why? If the penalty was, was a tax, then the tax anti injunction act blocks the suit, right? If the penalty was a tax, if you come back in two years, you can't sue the government. So he had to argue in day number one that the penalty was a tax. 
But in day number two, he had to argue that the penalty was a tax to uphold its constitutionality. So again, day number one, penalty not a tax. Day number two, penalty a tax. The same guy making these consecutive arguments on two different days. Now, you're saying Josh is insane. It's actually not. Let me let me give let me give really a defense. I think he did a very good job. Let me get him credit for this. There's a difference between interpreting a statute and interpreting the Constitution. Right? When Congress is interpreting, I'm sorry, when the government's interpreting a statute, they can make a more narrow argument. But when they're interpreting the Constitution, there are other factors at play, right? You can read the statute differently to avoid it being declared unconstitutional, which is what he did, right? You can argue that, well, the statute, this is not a tax, but we really should treat it as a tax for constitutionality to avoid declaring the, the bill unlawful. So he was basically baking into his entire strategy, don't strike down Obamacare, treat the penalty as a tax, but for the purposes of the Injunction Act, it's not a tax. So we basically have this chimera, this, this my friend Ilya Shapiro calls it a unicorn tax, right? Where it's a tax on Monday, but not on Tuesday, right? Once again, Alice in Wonderland, right? You know, words have no meaning anymore. But really made this argument, he made it pretty well. So there's also another issue at play here. Are the mandate and the penalty one and the same? The challengers argued that they were never actually challenging the mandate, right? The challengers argued that they were actually challenging the penalty, because they argued Congress cannot enact it. Right? They were not challenging the mandate. Though. Okay, the government made a different argument. They said, "Look, ready for this? There is no mandate." The government said there's no actual mandate. The government is not making you buy insurance. Instead, they're merely putting a tax on the uninsured. Okay. The government's argument was that there was no actual mandate to buy insurance. It was a tax on the uninsured. Yeah, well, I guess it's one of those. Get it? Yeah, they're, 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 they're trying to encourage you to make the right choice. That if you make the wrong choice, you pay a tax. But they're not making you buy it. Well, it's not just a language debate, though, right? Because the challengers argue that Congress did not have the power to make you buy insurance, right? They couldn't impose a purchase mandate. But the government said is we're not making you buy insurance. There's no mandate. We're simply taxing the people who don't. So what's the difference, right, between a penalty on the uninsured versus a tax on the uninsured? The penalty is based on the commerce clause, and the tax is based on the tax compliance clause, which is much broader. That's why they have to reframe the issue. Well, the statute didn't change. Right? The word of the statute is fixed. What changed is how the government's defending it. Right? Because the statute doesn't say tax, it says penalty. But they're saying you should read it as a penalty. I'm sorry, you should read the penalty as a tax to avoid declaring it unconstitutional. Well, he actually made this argument on day one about you have a tax on the uninsured. He made it on day one. What do you think he did, Chris? Chris? I have, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. So I don't want to license to talk to you. Okay, that's fine. All right. Um, so on day number one, we really got two points across. First, it's not attached to the injunction after the case is moved forward. And second, the law should be best understood as a tax on the uninsured. No one's paying attention. Day number two uh, didn't go off to a good start. Um, 
uh, a tip if you ever make an oral argument to all of your students this afternoon. Um, do not drink water before you get up there. Right before you get up there. Why? Sometimes when you drink water, it can go down the wrong pipe. And that's what happened to him. He got up there, took a drink of water, and he began, Mr. Chief Justice, may please the court. The biggest argument of his entire life. Then a few words into his opening statement, the microphone went silent. He was choking. He literally could not breathe. You can actually hear in the audio him grabbing into the water and trying to take a sip. Um, but he choked quite literally, right? He, figuratively, he didn't choke. But for about four or five seconds, he was silent. He said no words. It's the biggest case of his life. But let me tell you, this guy's a pro. After, after he choked, he repeated his opening verbatim. He had his opening commit to memory word for word. You think you can do that? You're making a Supreme Court argument, you choke, and then you repeat verbatim what you started off with? I can't do that. So I, I give I give really a lot of credit. You can't do that. People aren't, people aren't happy when I give them credit. I do. I think he did a really good job. But his argument here sucked, right? The reason why his argument sucked is because he had no limiting principle. The argument is this. If Congress can make you buy health insurance as a way to improve the healthcare market, what else can they do? Right? Where's the limit, right? What, what's the limiting principle? And he tries to say, well, healthcare is different, right? Because everyone needs uh, uh, healthcare. Well, actually, it's health insurance, right? And not everyone needs health insurance. People might decide to go uninsured. Um, he says, well, you have, uh, 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 you know, everyone's going to need health insurance eventually. Well, people need food eventually. You make fiber optic, they need food. Um, so the Commerce Clause argument was very dry. Then we have to talk also about the Necessary and Proper Clause. And really relied heavily on Raich, and particularly Justice Scalia's opinion in Raich. And remember what Justice Scalia held. Scalia said that you have local activity growing marijuana. Congress can regulate that local activity if that local activity can undercut a broader federal regulatory scheme, right? Because Angel and Diane's their local marijuana cultivation screwed up the federal regime, right? Screw up the federal regime, then you could ban a local activity. But really said, we need this mandate for Obamacare to work, right? If we don't have the mandate, the law will fall apart. We can't have people who are healthy going uninsured because then they can just join the marketplace and make the money. And really also said, there's not really a, 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 a mandate to buy insurance. You're really shifting when you pay for it, right? You can either pay for health insurance before, or you can pay for it afterwards by going through the emergency room. So this law basically shifts when people pay for their insurance. Um, it became very clear, at least to me, that these arguments were not going well. Um, Paul Clement, who was the U.S. Solicitor General, I'm sorry, the former Solicitor General, uh, had a much more receptive audience. Um, Chief Justice Roberts didn't really ask any questions. Didn't say much. Just kind of came right there, like, hmm, how do I make Josh angry for a second? I know how I'll do it. Ha ha. I have a wise one. He knows who I am, but he probably doesn't. He, I sent copies of my books to all the justices before and told them, he's the only one who's never responded to any of my books. So all the other ones responded except one. So it's fine. Got nice notes, got my office, got my wall, it's okay. Nothing else responded. Um, that was day number two. And then we get to day number three, right, which concerns severability. Um, the severability argument um, was significant. Um, even if the court found that the mandate was unconstitutional, they could perhaps salvage the rest of the law and still have all the other aspects of the law. Uh, but the government took a middle of the road position. The government said, look, if you kill the mandate, you have to kill the most popular aspect of the law, what's called guaranteed issue. Guaranteed issue means they have to issue a policy no matter how sick you are. They have to price it based on your community, not based on your health condition. The government said, if you kill the mandate, you have to kill also a guaranteed issue can't have people uh, uh, waiting to become sick to buy insurance. That's what, the court, that's what the government said. In other words, you think you want to kill Obamacare? Go ahead and kill the most popular part of the law. Go for it. Okay. Oh, yeah, and Scalia asked a broccoli question. That was funny. 
Uh, and then finally, on the final day, the final afternoon, they argue, they argue about the Medicaid expansion. I think I mentioned this anecdote. At one point, Chief Justice Roberts compared the Medicaid expansion to an old uh, a TV skit, where it's like a robber puts a gun to someone's head and says, money or your life. You're not going to choose the money. You're going to choose the life. Um, I mean, you're, choosing, you're not going to choose life. You're going to choose giving up the money. And you compare the Medicaid expansion to that. Any questions so far? After the Obamacare case was argued, all eyes turned to our former uh, Supreme Court overlord, Anthony Kennedy. Um, we also had two people to Supreme Court. In fact, I think I told you I wrote two different versions of the ending of my book, one where Kennedy upheld the law, the other where he struck it down. I think I told you that. Um, but in fact, the, the vote to watch was John Roberts, who actually was in the Zoom ahead last year. Here he does. Um, and here's how he felt. Um, what happened after the case was argued and before it was decided remains a matter of huge controversy and dispute. I don't know that we'll ever actually get the final answer until maybe decades from now and all the justices die. And I think it might be a while for that to figure out what happened. But at least as I tell it, and I think this is what happened, uh, the chief was pretty much set to find that Congress lack the power under the Commerce, Domestic, and Proper Clauses to enact the mandate. But he was less committed on the taxing power argument. What we also know is that Chief Justice Roberts basically made a deal with Justice Kagan and Breyer on the Medicaid expansion. And let me walk you through that. You are, I would not call them both constitutional scholars, also not call them both savvy litigators. Uh, but John Roberts made his decision, and now we're stuck. Um, I editorialized way too much in class. I'm sorry. I think this is what it's like. Um, <laughs> this describes the opinion in a nutshell, right? Uh, the court and Chief Justice Roberts concluded several things. First, John Roberts said, that Congress cannot enact the mandate to buy insurance under a necessary black proper clause, right? That insurance and the purchase of insurance is perhaps economic activity, but the decision not to buy insurance is not economic activity. Rach only said that you can regulate economic activity. Forget Webster's Third Dictionary. The decision not to buy insurance is not economic activity. Let me say that one more time. The decision not to buy insurance is not economic activity. Therefore, under Rach and Wickard, you cannot aggregate that decision to determine if there's a substantial effect in interstate commerce. Does that make sense? Next page. First, the court held that the Commerce Clause is not going to work because it's not economic activity. What about Scalia, right? What about Rage? Can't you say that if Congress allows people to go uninsured, it will undermine the entire federal law, it will undermine all the law? So here's where Roberts goes from the proper. He says it might be necessary, that is convenient, for Congress to mandate the purchase of insurance, but it is not proper. Why is it not proper? Because it's intruding on individual freedom. That never before in 200 years had Congress tried to make people buy a commercial product. They can't do it now. It was in every regard unprofessional. Or to use Justice Kennedy's question or his argument, the Obamacare law fundamentally changed the relationship between Congress and the federal government and between the states. Think of it this way. If Congress can make you buy something, they can basically shove you into the stream of commerce. That's where that phrase came from, right? Commerce, right? If Congress can make you buy a product, they can shove you into the stream of commerce. And once you're in that stream, they can regulate whatever they want. Had Congress upheld this purchase mandate power, 
They could have given the federal government an unlimited authority over local concerns. This was the line that the court drew in the Obamacare case, right? They cannot make you engage in economic activity because if they could do that, they could regulate whatever they wanted. Does that make sense? Good question. Why does any of this crap matter, right? In, in other words, why shouldn't the government be able to do whatever it thinks it needs, whatever it thinks not it needs? Why? Is that, is that the basic question? Because it's necessary. It's necessary. It's necessary. It's necessary. Um, let me give you a couple answers to your question. Um, you often think of, you know, the federal government trying to help promote human rights. But I think it's the federal government trying to harm human rights. Sorry? Let, let me save let me give you an example. Craig. Right? The federal government enacted the Fugitive Slave Act. Right? This was a law that regulated and mandated that state officials try to enforce federal law. Um, Sam and Chase argued that Congress did not have the power to intrude upon the state sovereignty there. Now, that was a case where the federal government was one stepping on federal human rights. I'll give you a more contemporary example, which is sanctuary cities, right? Uh, the federal government likes to have a very robust enforcement of immigration laws in certain cities, and the states are trying to resist it. Um, protecting federalism is not a one-sided affair. At times, it helps conservative causes, like in the Obamacare case, and in times, it helps progressive causes, like with the, the sanctuary cities case. Um, I actually don't care whose side is helping. I care that's in the Constitution, and it's largely irrelevant to me. I mean, your question more broadly is why should we say that? My answer is amend the Constitution if you don't like it. But I think the better answer is if you abandon it here, then you abandon it in other contexts where it might be more friendly to people. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote you on that in a couple of weeks. Okay. Nope. Um, no, yeah. Um, Look. So I think your question is, how do we deal with contemporary problems that the Constitution does not address? Yeah. Well, there's an answer that you can enact new laws. Maybe the courts aren't the answer. And then what happens? And what happens if states don't enact the policies you, you like? Uh, no, no, no. But no, we're, we're saying the courts aren't involved. What happens if a state enacts laws you don't like? Well, I'm But that's the question, though, right? The reason why federal constitutional law is so popular is it sets a one-size-fits-all standard for every state, right? But if the Constitution says nothing about a given topic, then you have to persuade people. Right? And what if you can't persuade people? Then things stay the same. Uh, well, no, but again, the ACLU is courts, right? The ACLU goes to court. 
I think what your question more fundamentally is, if you can't rely on the courts, the democratic process will do what you want, then what? Um, sometimes life sucks. It's an, it's an awful answer. It's a terrible answer. But if you're dependent upon Justice Kennedy's mood for the day, her right, <coughs> Uh, you're you're in a very sore, sore spot. That's not a good. It's not a good way to rely on democracy, right? If if what you mean by persuading the courts is to persuade Justice Kennedy one way or the other, or John Roberts in this case, mm -hmm. that's not a very stable framework because now Justice Kennedy's retired and they have to put Kavanaugh. And if you're actually willing to put faith in the courts, then you put your faith in the courts, and that might not give you results you like. Yeah, it, this class is a lot. There's a lot of unfair stuff in this class, right? We read only judicial decisions in this class, but you're talking about legislation, things that actually pass democratic process. If states are enacting laws you like, or they're not enacting laws that you favor, uh, then you might say you have to lobby for them. Maybe you can't, maybe you don't have the opportunity to, or maybe there's not enough votes for it. Um, at that point, the answer is times change and persuasions change. I mean, we'll discuss segregation at some length, but Throughout the 20th century, the views on segregation changed, not overnight, but over the course of decades. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't in one day. It wasn't, you know, Brown was decided in one day and the schools opened up the next day. In some cases, it took decades. Um, change takes time, and often law students are not patient. We want, we, want, we want Justice King to decide this now and be done with it now. Guess what? He's gone. Right? He's gone. He's not here anymore. He's retired. He's giving speeches. Well, calling people apathetic is an effective means of persuasion. I think. I think it's a. It, it, I mean, look, this will be much more of a. I think a salient topic in the second half. Maybe the fourth year, right? With segregation and uh, those sorts of issues. Um, but I'll just use Brown as an example. Brown was decided in 1954. That we all know is a big case. Schools didn't desegregate for a decade. Southern states thumbed their nose, and actually northern states, let's just go southern. But both southern and northern states thumbed their nose at the decision for some time. And it wasn't until people actually, I, I won't say change of heart, but like came around to the idea, and the federal government started like enforcing things with money, that things changed. The, the, the courts, I'll make this point a little broadly, right? Courts cannot change people's minds. Um, by the time a court re issues a ruling, People usually have made up their minds already. The Supreme Court decided the gay marriage case in 2015, right? Had they held in 2003 that the right to gay marriage had been ridiculed, right? The court would never have been respected. People would have ignored it. By the time we got to 2015, there was more or less, not quite 50% support nationwide, but in most states, there was like a bare majority support nationwide. It wasn't quite, you know, close to 50%. So it wasn't really much of a backlash. Um, in the 1970s, the Supreme Court ruled the death penalty was unconstitutional. That was a disaster. It was so unpopular, they reversed themselves after a couple of years. It was a disaster. They, they actually said, never mind, we're just kidding. Right? We reversed ourselves. So you, you can't rely on the court solely unless there's a popular support behind it. And if all you have is five votes in the Supreme Court, you're in trouble. Think of the other way, right? Think of the five conservatives, like the horsemen, right? They were ruling that the Constitution says you can't do this to Roosevelt. And they were unpopular, right? Roosevelt won a landslide re-election. And his party, the Democrats, had a majority vote in both houses. They were the democratic process, right? They were the ones enacting laws. And it was the conservatives stopping them. And then Roosevelt said, okay, screw this. We'll just, we'll just pack the court, get rid of them, right? So it's very difficult if the court is ruling in a fashion that's inconsistent with how people actually live their lives. It, it, you, you can't lose sight of that fact. We, I promise you, we will come back to this uh, over and over again. But he said one thing. He said something like, you're enforcing rights that aren't written down or something like that. I'm paraphrasing you. Oh, boy, we'll come back to that one, right? Because the second half of the class is all stuff that's not written down. Abortion, marriage, right? Yeah, all, all the un, uh, unenumerated rights. So we'll, we'll come back. We'll come back to that in, 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 in great detail in the second half of the semester. So thank you for the questions. Right, so if your hand's been up and down, I'm not sure if you want to take it.
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good analogy, but the necessary and proper bit comes from John Marshall, right? I mean, it's not like it's not like John Roberts made this up of whole cloth. John Marshall said that when you have this great substantive independent power, it's not proper. In other words, uh, the necessary and proper clause gives Congress incidental powers, right? If they want to have a postal system, they can hire mailmen, hire horses, and wagons, stuff like that, like, you know, small stuff, right? But where the incident, where, where the secondary thing is so big, right? So the little thing is, let's regulate the healthcare market. How are we going to do it? We're going to make people buy insurance, right? Where the incidental part is bigger than the whole, right? Where the most significant part of the law is the mandate, that goes too far. It's a, Robert says it's a great substantive and independent power. I remember GSIP, great substantive and independent power. And they can't do that, right? The incidental part has to be smaller. It can't be bigger than the, than the, than the, than the federal program itself. And for that reason, the court finds, and there are five votes in this class, it's not a proper exercise of federal power. It goes beyond the enumerated powers. Okay. Okay. I'm with you so far. Now, there were five votes for the Commerce Clause provision, and five votes for the Necessary and Proper Clause. Generally, that means win, right? That was not the end of the story. One note, though, um, there was a joint opinion by Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito. Um, each of them joined it entirely. It wasn't like opinion by Scalia joined by Thomas, and et cetera. They all joined it together, which was fairly rare. Um, there's some discussion that the justices were mad at Roberts. Maybe they want to give them five votes. It doesn't really matter. There are five votes for each of them. But then we get to the taxing power. There are also five votes that Congress can enact the ACA under the taxing power. Now, I'll be very careful here. The court did not hold that Congress wrote the statute as a tax. Roberts did not hold that the, that the ACA was actually a tax. He did not hold that. Instead, what he said is that the penalty to buy insurance could be read as a tax. It wasn't. He said the best reading of it is a penalty. But it could be read as a tax because it resembles a tax. You pay it with your tax returns. It's collected by the IRS. It raises revenue, etc. Okay, Because the penalty could be read as a tax, the law can be upheld. He chose this route as a means of constitutional avoidance, right? To avoid declaring the statute unconstitutional, he would read it as a tax on going uninsured. He accepted the Kavanaugh argument, he accepted the John Boyd argument. So the tax on the uninsured. That's what I hate when I hear that. Um, it was a tax on going uninsured. Okay? There were five votes for that position. Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. Now, do you think they actually agreed with him? Of course not. Ginsburg basically laughs and saying, yeah, whatever, Roberts. I'm going to join you, but I don't really agree with you. You got that kind of, right? You got that vibe. It's like, it's like, okay, whatever. She didn't care. It didn't matter because it upheld the law. Had Roberts not done that, Obama could have been toast. We would have it. It would not exist. It would be a thing of the past. And I'm, I think Obama might have lost the election had the, had the court um, ruled the other way. I think Republicans were, were incensed by this decision. But, um, also, Mitt Romney basically invented Obamacare. Uh, Tyler alluded to it earlier. In Massachusetts, the governor Mitt Romney basically imposed a mandate. He was the worst possible candidate on this issue imaginable. So I think had the court went the other way, uh, I, I don't know if they have left it. Had to make, no, I don't know. Like, I'm not political podcast. Okay. Where's my thing? Oh, it's right here. Okay. So the court upheld it. What about the Medicaid expansion? What about the Medicaid expansion? Here, too, Roberts rewrote the statute, right? The statute said all 50 states must expand Medicaid, but Roberts, joined by Breyer and Kagan, said, no, no, 
That's unconstitutional least coercive, right? You have to give states a choice. They have to be able to choose whether or not to expand Medicaid. If they choose, then there's not a problem. If they don't choose, then they don't expand it. Breyer and Kagan are very pragmatic, and they went along with Roberts to basically rewrite the expansion. So as it stands today, states have a choice. Uh, 30 something states have expanded Medicaid, other states haven't. Texas, for example, right? Texas not expanded Medicaid. And this creates problems. Let me explain why. Obamacare said you raise the Medicaid rate from 100% of poverty line to 133% of poverty line, right? So those people in that gap from 100 to 133 get, get Medicaid. So the ACA didn't provide any subsidies for people in that, in that gap. Hello, Texas. We didn't expand. So there's an entire group of people who are just above the poverty line who cannot get Obamacare subsidies because Texas didn't expand. They rewrote the law in a way that makes no sense whatsoever, right? Roberts rewrote the law to make the penalty a tax, and he rewrote the law to uphold the Medicaid expansion in ways that basically bastardizes the law to operate it when it never should operate. Right? So the law we have, again, was a draft that's been rewritten by the Supreme Court a couple times. That's where we are. Um, Justice, uh, again, uh, Scalia and Kennedy were the lead authors of the, uh, of the, of the, of the two-on opinion. Um, Justice Thomas wrote his usual concurrence saying that the 20th century is unconstitutional, or at least most of it. Uh, he would basically go back and reverse all of these cases from the 17th to top of the uh, he, he says the same thing in every case, but he just makes it worse for all. Uh, but he's always very consistent on making this point wherever he can. Okay, and then Ginsburg and Sotomayor would have upheld the ACA in its entirety. Um, so any questions about the opinion itself? I'm sort of going quickly and rapidly, but I think we're making good progress. The opinion, the opinion itself. Yes, please, please ask whatever you want. Yeah, do you write them down in advance? Again, this is like my my method. It just follows me everywhere I go. It's like my my my, my objectors are there. It's just haunting me. Um, okay. Now, as you can imagine, the opinion was fairly complicated. Um, I had a personal story that that's pretty funny, which I like telling at this juncture. Uh, I was actually planning to fly to London the morning this case came out. Now, I knew this would be the last day of the term, but I figured, okay, my flight leaves around uh, 10.30 Eastern. Um, I'll download the opinion. There was no Wi-Fi back then. There were no Wi-Fi on planes, right? Flight leaves around 10.30 Eastern. I'll download the opinion. I'll read it on the plane. Uh, you know, I have like, a, like an eight-hour flight. I'll read it. And when I land, you know, I'll be in England. I can write it. <sighs> Not to be. Uh, that morning, the Supreme Court announced a couple opinions which no one really cared about. And then the Chief Justice starts to announce the Obamacare decision. And the way it works is as soon as the Chief Justice starts talking, the court hands out paper copies of the opinion, right, to the reporters. And they have interns who actually grab the opinion and they run outside down the steps of the street and they hand it to the reporters waiting by the counter. It's called the running of the intern. It's an annual tradition. Right? You have these interns in sneakers and suits. It's very cute, right? Um, one of the interns ran the opinion to a reporter on the street who looked at it quickly. He saw the first part where it says, Chief Justice Roberts found the law violated the necessary proper clause, the commerce clause, and he stopped reading. He didn't read for the two weeks on it. So CNN went wall to wall with Obamacare is struck down. I actually have a tablet, I think it's a tablet. Um, Google Nest is one, et cetera. Um, millions of people thought for some time that Obamacare was unconstitutional. Guess who's watching CNN? Obama. He actually thought for some time 
that the law was unconstitutional. Can you imagine that? That based on a, and this was literal fake news, right? The word fake news didn't exist back then. This was actual fake news. That the president's watching CNN and they're going wall to wall saying things are constitutional. And he's like, oh crap. But he probably something a little more off color. Um, Fox the same. Big Joe, Mike Kelly, uh, declare the mandate unconstitutional. Where was this? This was 2012. Um, but the problem was that no one had the actual PDF. You couldn't use it because the Supreme Court's website crashed. It crashed hard. Um, at the time, I was basically sitting on the plane and we were about to take off. And uh, my girlfriend, I said, can you please email me the opinion as soon as you get it? And she was telling me I can't, that the Supreme Court website's down. And, you know, my flight was actually on time. This was Chicago O'Hare, where we got on time. So we were basically actually taxiing on the runway. I'm like, come on, just get me the opinion. And then at the last minute, she sends me a message that says, John Roberts voted to pull the Affordable Care Act. And then it took off. And I didn't get the opinion. And for eight hours, all I had was John Roberts voted to pull the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> it, was, it was a cathartic experience. Because down below, where all these people were on planet Earth, was this insanity. It was people going crazy. They were flipping out. And I was 35,000 feet in the sky across the Atlantic, across the Atlantic. And I was just away from all of it. I couldn't check my email. There was no Wi-Fi. Uh, my laptop battery died. There were no, there were no plugs back then. Um, I was sitting in coach, but I didn't have my usual status like I do now. Um, and I landed in London. And I guess I must have landed. It was the middle of the night when I landed. Maybe 4 or 5 p.m. I could have been like in the middle of the night late with the time change. And I pull up to a Wi-Fi hotspot, and I just check my email. I have like, oh, like 300 messages. I'm like, oh, my God, what the hell's going on? And then I stayed up all night. I read the opinion. I don't think I slept that night. I stayed up all night, read the opinion. And I was thinking, like, what the hell just happened? Like, what, what was that? And I don't think I actually came to grips with the opinion for, like, a couple of years. It took, it took me a while to actually be able to, like, understand what happened. I'm still feeling that. But in the end, uh, the Affordable Care Act failed. You can see he's holding a CNN tablet saying mandate struck down. This is a parody of the Dewey the Beats Truman poster where um, a newspaper ran a headline saying President Dewey won the election and Truman won. And then Truman folded the paper saying Dewey beats Truman. Uh, and then Don Verley, I think, did a good job. Uh, John Roberts, on the other hand, I'm still disappointed. And he continues disappointment on an annual basis. He will disappoint me again. Oh, you'll be here for June. I never get to teach people on the last day of class. Uh, You'll be here on June 26th, whatever it is. I'll be angry for a lot of reasons. You know, then. Usually the term finishes at the end of June. I don't have class, but who knows? Who knows what the blank it is. Uh, Roberts was ridiculed. He was called a coward by Glenn Beck and others. Um, Mitt Romney was like, oh, man. Mitt Romney was like, oh, why couldn't they take this off my plate? So he said, we have to repeal and replace Obamacare. Again, he was the... <laughs> Obama called Romney the debate the godfather of Obamacare. He said, you invented it. And he was right. He was right. Um, so the election went as it went. And I thought in 2012, as I was wrapping up my book, that the repeal efforts would die. That with the election of um, Mitt Romney, I'm sorry, of, of, of Mitt Romney's defeat and President Obama's election, I thought, you know what? People are going to get over it. They'll say, okay, Obamacare is fine, let's just move on. Um, I was wrong. <laughs> to this day, there's an effort in the courts in the Fifth Circuit next month to declare all of Obamacare unconstitutional. And not even in December, four or five months ago, a federal court in Dallas held that all of Obamacare is unconstitutional. Uh, he cited me, the judge, like four or five times, which was nice, so your book didn't have the cited opinion to declare Obamacare unconstitutional. So I suppose this is sort of a vicious cycle that never ends. It's, uh, it's this never ending summer. Uh, President Obama was sworn in as Marbury, and then there's Madison, then Jefferson. Um, I would love to refer with Roberts and Obama the same, but I can't do that. So I'm sure that will never be the case. And here we are. Uh, you know, I made this slide in 2013. Um, he's out of office, and he's not. Uh, and he's still.
most important going to Spain for uh, years later, and I think he'll be there to make my life miserable for many years to come. I'm done. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, good time. All right, questions? I usually give that talk in about 45 minutes. You've got the abbreviated calendar for the next year. So I, I give this talk all day. I think it's good for all of us. No, it wasn't her fault. The Supreme Court website crashed. Okay, pull it together. And this is the last number I told the story. I just let him go home and start again. Again, this I, 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 I have no notes. This is like completely memorized. It's almost like muscle memory. Like I haven't even looked at this in eight days. Don't understand. To this day, they don't understand. No one let her go. And all these reporters are going wall to wall asking people, Obamacare shut down, right? I read it that night. I was, I was super fuzzy. I, I jet lagged at this point. Plus, jet lagged that night. I gave a presentation the next day at lunch and it sucked. I was in a little holiday in hotel and I hate airports. It's just, you know. Overpaid for a bunch of taxes. The hotel probably didn't know about it. It was very, it was very angry uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, I ripped off a currency conversion that was like contracted. Um, you know. Oh, this is funny. Well, when I was clearing customs in London, they asked me what profession. So I was about to start teaching. So I said law professor. I was like, not a law professor. Yes, I am. I didn't have my ID card yet. It was. Anyways, I got the. Let me just say, over the summer during his hearing, I actually published on my blog the chapter of my book where I talked about the Kavanaugh opinion. It's a lot of pictures in there. So it, it, was, it was still sailing last summer. No comment on that one. I don't like you. All right, anything else? All right, I'll see you guys all tomorrow. Have a good night. We start, I, I think tomorrow we start the 14th Amendment, don't we? I think we do. Oh no no I'm sorry no we do we do federal we do uh, federal stuff we do um oh New York and Springs okay very good cases all right thank you we'll do that we'll do that maybe next week I know.